and good morning. Um, welcome to the, the uh, Compressed Air Technical Webinar. Um, a quick introduction um, to the, the Carbon Trust. We're a not-for-profit organization um, with a mission to accelerate the move to sustainable, low-carbon economy. Um, to, to support our mission, we offer um, advice. Uh, so that would be to businesses, governments and public sectors uh, across the world. We also carry out f f footprinting to help to measure and certify the um, environmental performance um, of organizations and of products and of their services. And we also help to develop and deploy low carbon technologies and solutions. Um, the agenda today for the uh, technical webinar is we'll um, just quickly go through the basics um, of uh, compressed air and then look at the various aspects of a compressed air system. And then we'll look at the uh, options for energy s savings, um, uh, evidence those with some case studies, and then look at how we can help you to uh, finance um, improvements to your compressed air system. So the idea um, is to uh, help you become a little bit more aware of the technology if you're not fully up to speed with it. Um, again, we'll look at the main components and look at the areas for savings as well. So um, compressed air as a, um, as a service, I suppose, is one of the most wild, widely um, used in industry. Um, it's basically just a way of uh, storing and transferring energy from one place to another. It's often used um, as a prime mover. Um, typically, it's used for powering uh, machinery, hand tools, and for a variety of control systems as well. Um, as, a, uh, as a utility, as a service, it's extremely versatile. Um, it's uh, estimated that over 10% of the electricity that's supplied to UK industry is actually used to compressed air. Um, it's worth noting that um, as a utility, it's, uh, it's extremely expensive to manufacture. So if you don't have to use compressed air, then it's usually always the case that you know, um, if you're able to find a different way of carrying out the same function, then you should. Um, as you can see, uh, it's used um, all over industry and, and businesses. A typical circuit is uh, one that we would see it's similar across the UK. Um, the main component, of course, is the compressor itself, whose role is to it uh, takes in the air and compresses it up to the required pressure. Obviously, that's where uh, a lot of the saving opportunities are. So it's important to have very good um, control and to um, maintain uh, uh, the equipment in, in good working order. Um, after the air is compressed, then it moves through to the receiver, which just basically acts as a buffer, um, so that the so that the system is able to manage the variations in demand. Uh, after that, you're into a series of filters, coolers, and dryers, which basically treat the air so that it's of a quality that a isn't going to damage the system, and b that it can be used safely. And then you have the air line, which is essentially just the the distribution system. Uh, so going for looking at the main component, which is the compressors. Um, they're usually um, all that a compressor does is is it does what it's called essentially, and that's just to um, pressurize the air. Um, the main types would be uh, the smaller ones, although they can range up to half a megawatt, would be the, the, the piston and the reciprocating compressor. So you'd often hear those in, in 
um, garage workshops, etc. There's also then the rotary vein that are typically there for um, industrial use from one up to 75 kilowatts, so fairly fairly small. Um, and then you've got your rotary compressors, which are are your uh, typically they're going to be going up to your larger machines, but those those would be the most typical that you'd see. So after you've after you've compressed the air, um, there's always going to be a lot of impurities in that, and um, it's important that you prevent that um, getting through to the end of use um, equipment. So um, in in the vast majority of compressed air systems, you will find some s sort of treatment to to um, uh, to keep the air clean. Um, as I said, the air treatment can be also energy intensive, so it's important that you only treat it to the uh, to the uh, required uh, standard. Um, it's often that the um, there's 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 quite good guidance on the um, level of treatment uh, uh, required um, for a range of functions, and that's um, outlined in the um, ISO standard there. The typical air treatment components you've got your um, after cooler, where um, after the air is compressed, it can um, it, it typically uh, adds quite a, a hot um, temperature. What the aftercooler does then is it, it seeks to cool the air down. And that can either be through a water jacket or it can be an air to air, air, to air heat exchanger. Um, so obviously, as the air is cooled, then the moisture within it begins to f form out as a condensate, which is often um, mixed with oil, um, and that is and um, well, that would need to be um, removed from the system, and that's where you have a series of uh, drain traps or, or a water separator. Um, and as I said, it's the it's the uh, water separator then that seeks to remove the water from the system. The air then goes on to the air receiver. Um, it's a, a storage tank again that just seeks to um, manage the supply of the air to the system and helps to um, um, helps to make that supply uh, consistent. Um, usually, if you can, you want to locate them um, externally uh, and in a cool location as uh, a lot of the condensation um, separation is done in the um, air receiver and they will often have uh, drain traps uh, there to uh, allow that um, condensate to be drained off. Um, you've also then got a, a s s series of uh, pre-filters and after filters. Um, again, just they are uh, seeking to get um, the compressed air to the correct quality. So while the while uh, the storage tank has has carried out um, some of the condensate removal, you still, um, depending on the quality of the air that you need, um, you will still um, uh, have to condensate out more or to or remove more uh, moisture from the air. And there's a variety of ways that this can be done. It can be done through a, a, um, a series of dryers. Um, they can be uh, Desiccant dryers, which can um, achieve a very low dew point, but again at a cost, um, and then up to the likes of the refrigerated um, dryers, which are normally they would be the most common that you would see, and the modern ones are fairly um, efficient as 
well. Um, you've also got uh, waste heat recovery chemical dryers, but um, to be honest, the number of those that I've seen on my travels um, would be would be f f fairly few and far between. But as I said, you've got the more common would be the desiccant um, dryers, which you need if you're going for the very low dew points, which would be probably if you were in to food manufacture, they tend to have the have the um, highest uh, uh, requirement. Um, but there's also the uh, likes of the Membian dryers, but they would be for fairly small and uh, specialist uh, duties only. Um, this slide helps to demonstrate that there there is a cost um, to treating the air. Um, so it's trying to uh, reinforce the point that you should only be treating the air to the dew point that you actually require. Um, uh, typical energy s s saving opportunities then. Um, this graph is taken from the from the work that the Carbon Trust has done over the last f f 15 years, um, in particular with uh, projects that have come through uh, the um, energy efficiency financing, uh, the industry loan scheme, etc. And it's, uh, it's showing you the potential savings on the left-hand side of the graph and the number of sites where typically um, these opportunities would be found. So um, you can see obviously the the uh, the lowest cost and therefore the most popular is the um, leakage reduction, which is a um, is a uh, huge cost in compressed air systems, but we'll we'll go on to talk about that um in a few slides um obviously the the normal kind of projects that you would you would probably have looked at would be um changing out for bsd D compressors um and maybe upgrading the likes of uh, the compressor control uh, and still there are very good um opportunities with regards to the the kind of um cheaper options, you know, looking to um, reduce the generation pressure or to um, upgrade the drain traps as well. As I said, the generation of compressed air is, a, is, is very expensive. Um, typically, 90% of the energy that goes into compressing air is uh, lost um, as heat. Uh, so of that, 100% that you put in, you're only getting 10% uh, useful work out of it. As such, if you can avoid using compressed air, then you should. Um, so in many cases, you can replace um, com uh, likes of compressed air hand tools um, with um, electric or battery tools. Um, um also with the likes of um changing out the cylinders for other electric or, or even hydraulic drives and the worst thing to be done is to use compressed air for for blowing off and cleaning purposes we would see this all the time um often um where uh employees would be um would be using the compressed air to, to to clean themselves down, which um, regardless of it being wasteful, is also um, uh, very risky as well. So the next graph there is just to try and um, illustrate uh, the cost uh, of that um, use of compressed air, that the kind of uncontrolled, um, with regards to trying to reduce leaks. Um, typically, I think we would see uh, compressed air systems that would routinely have be wasting 30 to 40% of their compressed air through 
leaks. Um, you can walk through a plant. You can you can hear them. Um, you can see um, on the wall where there's the oil stain where the leak has clearly been there for for quite some time and hasn't been reported, hasn't been fixed. Um, there is a cost to that. Um, and I would I would regularly be in um, in uh, uh, plant rooms and and on the on the uh, sh shop floor where there's obvious leaks there that are costing the organisation in excess of one two thousand pounds a year, um, and that would be that would be very common. So as we talked about the leaks, I mean all all compressed air systems are going to have leaks, even new ones. But um, uh, making the effort uh, to reduce those leaks is uh, very very cost effective. Um, I mean you're not going to get z zero leaks, but but typically um, if you can aim for for those kind of uh, maximum uh, loss rates, uh, then you'll be doing fairly well. But as I said, uh, quite often you'll get um, quite high energy waste. You'll also get a drop in the system pressure, which means that you have to generate at a higher pressure, which again costs you more. Um, the common areas that you get would be um, at the couplings, the hoses, um, Often the pressure regulators as well. Um, open condensate traps is, is is quite a common one. Um, but if your um, if your organisation is using jubilee clips um, to secure the, the the hoses, then that's uh, you know you, you're you're going to have a lot more uh, leaks than you realise. Um, and it would be better practice to go f for the um, for the crimp type. Uh, um, couplings that are that, that are uh, specialist um, to compressed air systems. So the other saving opportunities then is to reduce the pressure. As I as I said, the higher the pressure, um, then the uh, greater the cost it is. Um, Often you'll find that if you ask ask the question as to as to why the system is generating at 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 a given pressure, there is no answer. It's it's just a, a case that well, it has always done that. So there is an opportunity there to gradually um, reduce the pressure by half a bar over time um, and s s see how the um, how the s system operates um, but there's also the opportunity obviously to um, look at the equipment that is um, on the system uh, to see if that can be improved is the uh, is the paper um, undersized is there are there any pinch points um, it's good to isolate areas that aren't in production often you'll find there's been um, there's been a change in the Layout and and there there are long runs of um, redundant pipe that that have remained charged so um, those can be isolated. All these things will help you reduce it and you know just by reducing one bar it'll uh, reduce your uh, power consumption by eight percent. Well worth doing. So as we said at the compressors then that's the that's one. Um, that's the most energy uh, intensive area of the system. And there are uh, a s series of control strategies um, which are suitable. So for your, for your smaller uh, machines, typically a uh, stop start um, a control is, is appropriate. Um, if you start going into larger systems and you get issues with the um, with stop, stopping and starting the uh, larger motors. Um, throttling or the modulating valve as it's often called, that's um, it, it's generally inefficient to run the modulating control at lower than 70% of the capacity. 
there's also load off um, load on control um, and then the most appropriate control in a in a wider system then would be to have some variable speed control which will then uh, vary the output by varying the motor speed um, has its applications on typical um, machines um, but you can see compared to the on off load and the inlet throttling valve that um, often the use of the VSD will get you the same output at a much reduced um, power requirement. Um, again, just to uh, reinforce the, the, the point as to where the opportunities are with the variable speed drives, you can see um, comparing it to the modulating control or the load offload, um, again, you get um, a, a significant energy saving when you uh, go for the variable speed control. Um, in terms of the whole life costing, um, there's uh, there's a s s significant opportunity um, to uh, to um, increase the savings if you look at the um, at the top uh, pie chart there. That's that's explaining with regards to the, the whole life cost of a compressor, where it's actually only 10% of the whole life cost is the purchase price, um, and the vast majority of it is actually running costs so um the bottom graphs explaining that yes while a vsd uh while a vsd um drive or a vsd compressor is more expensive in the upfront over the course of its life you will more than uh recoup that in um reduced costs and, and uh or with reduced running costs sorry so also in uh, systems where you have more than one compressor, um, it's often uh, the f f uh, it will be good uh, practice um, to install a a, a group of compressor control. Um, these will these essentially are able to match the current air demand um, with the correct compressor so that um, the, uh, the the required are being generated is being uh, generated by the most efficient um, compressor mix um, typically there there would be less than a less than a thousand pounds but um, you know, in, in, in terms of the long-term running costs, of the system, um, they are very, uh, very effective. Uh, as I'd outlined, the 90% uh, of the energy that goes into compressed the air is lost as heat. Um, obviously, there's a very good opportunity to um, recover that heat. Um, that, that that can be done. Um, either uh, quite s simply by um, ducting the uh, warmer that's uh, that's been given out by the compressor uh, and using that as warmer heating. That's the s simplest way to do it. So often you would duct that into the um, into the s say the factory floor. And you would have a small um, divert valve on it, so that during the summer you could um, you could continue just to ex exhaust that to atmosphere. Um, but also in the typically the larger compressed air systems, you would see the waste heat been um, utilised to maybe um, uh, heat the uh, domestic hot water demand, or often I've s seen it where it would. Um, Preheat the uh, the water to to the uh, s s steam boiler. So there's a there's a variety of very good, very very cost effective opportunities to utilize the waste heat. Um, another common um, 
waste is, is uh, through the choice of the condensate valve. Um, they're they're used to uh, uh, remove the condensate from a from a variety of um, locations along the system. This would typically be um, at the air receiver. Um, usually, it's a it would be a timed little solenoid drain um, that just uh, allows some of the compressed air to to exhaust with the condensate, and that's us usually done. Um, by uh, s setting a time interval, but the problem with that is that um, they they uh, they are prone to failure, um, and also that they are um, uh, they don't they don't take cognizance then of um, any um, any difference in the atmosphere. Ferric uh, conditions, you know, with regards to higher humidity, you're going to get um, higher condensate. Um, and as you can see from the from the picture, they're they're often very um, inappropriately set. Um, as you can see from the staining on that wall, that that has been blowing out condensate like that for quite some time, and and has gone on noticed. But um, a more uh, efficient way is to is to use a no loss condensate drain, which uh, effectively works off a high and low level of condensate. So um, once obviously the condensate reaches the high level, then the valve opens, um, and as the constant level then drops, um, once it reaches the low level, then it uh, shuts itself down, so there is no loss um, of compressed air from the system. So we'll look at um, a few case studies uh, with regards to a variable speed um, Presser, so that this was a, I think this was a drinks manufacturer, if I remember rightly. And they had uh, the two or three uh, large fixed speed air compressors. And uh, they realized that in terms of the f then their fluctuations of demand, it wasn't an optimum uh, way to service that requirement. Um, so they went for a, a new. Uh, Variable speed, um, with the uh, resulting savings due to that uh, more appropriate matching, um, they were getting a uh, pr project payback then of less than two years. Um, the project obviously uh, attracted the 15% uh, capital contribution um, from the green business. Fund, which was um, able to uh, drop that payback then to below the two years. Um, again, a poultry producer similar to the to the previous had a um, had three uh, fixed speed compressors. Again, they were they were uh, they were struggling to. Uh, match the demand, and again, a great opportunity to to drop in a uh, VSD to um, to better uh, utilise the variations um, in the load, um, both across the site and during uh, during the working day. And um, again, uh, attracted the uh, capital contribution with um, a good and um, very attractive uh, payback then of less than two and a half years. This was a um, this was a site that had uh, expanded reasonably rapidly. Um, as a result, the, you know they 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 weren't um, able to give the um, to give the uh, kind of do do um, focus on 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 how best to uh, to expand the compressed air system to suit. So 
as a result, it was a bit cobbled together, um, resulting in kind of res uh, restrictions and and pinch points that were causing a a, a pressure drop. But um, so they were um, able to um, to improve on the ring main. Um, so uh, allowing them um, then to to uh, uh, reduce that pressure drop, and as we've uh, as we've outlined earlier, you know even a very modest um, reduction in the generation pressure can lead to quite uh, significant uh, savings. We'd uh, talked about the use of uh, air for um, you know, for uh, clean down or for product cooling. Uh, there's 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 a variety of of um, open open ended uh, use of uh, of compressed air, but this, this uh, case study helps to reinforce that um, if you have to use it, then at or if you have to use it in this way, then it's well worth investing in the most appropriate um, nozzle for it. Um, you know, a, for a uh, for modest cost, um, you know, there are uh, s significant savings. Okay, so you've had a look at the um, at the compressor system. You're there's there's some good um, projects there. So the green business f fund then is is a vehicle for you to um, attract some capital contribution to to uh, uh, to help f f fund that or to help um, incentivize you um, to go on and to make the savings. Um, it's operated by the Carbon Trust. Um, it's Currently uh, open to small and medium-sized businesses in England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, the fund itself uh, provides uh, a combination of free advice training and, as we talked about, the direct contribution. So it's open again, England, Scotland, and Wales only. Um, it's um, domestic and the public sector and new bills are not eligible f for it and that um, that definition for an uh, SME is uh, fairly uh, standard as well. So in terms of um, the offerings um, there's the energy efficiency training which are typically a, a couple of hours workshops which have been hosted by the Carbon Trust um, in a variety of uh, locations across the UK and um, the aim of them is to help um, uh, organisations understand their energy consumptions and to quickly help them then to identify the opportunities that there are. Um, there's a variety on in April and May this year. Uh, I think so far then, um, I think we've trained, uh, I think it's well over 135 companies by now, so um, they're, they're well worth looking out for. There's also then the opportunities assessment, which can be, uh, these are carried out um, by a um, Carbon Trust engineer. Um, these can either be remote or on or an on-site assessment. Um, that depends on your on your level of energy spent. Um, the idea is to quickly identify uh, the top three um, energy saving recommendations, um, and we would uh, they're available for um, SMEs again just in England, Scotland. Um, and wheels. There's also 
um, implementation advice to this would be typically where you have a good handle on a project that you want to proceed with. Um, and we're able to provide you with up to five days uh, support with that, where we would um, uh, we would then um, look at what the project is and provide you um, with the tender documentations and actually we'll we'll carry out the uh, the tender process for you um, and we then would um, invite a uh, shortlist then of uh, credible um, suppliers to uh, tender for that work and uh, once those tenders come back in we would then prov provide a independent review um, of the uh, resulting proposals and there's some some uh, good uh, examples there for LED uh, projects that have already gone through and then we come to the capital contribution um, which is a non-refundable 15% uh, uh, for projects with a payback of less than five years. So that's 15% of the project capital cost. It is a, it's a very straightforward process. Um, you just provide us with a, with a quotation from an accredited supplier. Um, there is, of course, going to be some financial verification and an identity check. And all of the projects are technically um, assessed um, just to just to confirm the the project particulars. Um, the typically they're turning these around, and uh, as long as all of the as long as all the documentation is there, they can turn these around in uh, under two weeks. All the information, of course, is is uh, um, accessible on the Carbon Trust website. Um, if you're if you're going to be purchasing um, energy energy efficient equipment, it is worth checking, or it's even worth insisting that the um, equipment that you are provided with is on the, the energy technology list, which is a which is um, a government approved list of energy efficient products um, the advantage of that is that you can claim then um, an enhanced capital allowance obviously for only those organizations that pay income or corporation tax you can um, you can claim a uh, uh, the enhanced capital allowances which which can be significant so there's um, I organization say spending ten thousand pounds say a uh, say a new new compressor, then that uh, that could that could be a two thousand pound benefit um to you. So it's well worth just making that check and and or and insisting that the equipment that you are being provided with is on that list. Um if you are l looking for for credible s suppliers um then um you could do worse than looking at the um at the carbon trust green business directory um it's online um it is a uh, free to use resource it's um the uh, companies that are that are listed on that have gone through an independent uh, assessment um, and have had their skills and services validated by the Carbon Trust. Uh, as I said, look, it's all online. It's um, easily filterable, so you can look at technology and uh, location as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Imogen. Thank you.